Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Emil Kiner. Uh, I see some people are filtering in, but I'll get started. Um, I'm a product manager on the networking team. And today we'll be talking about uh, DDoS protection as well as a web application firewall. And we'll talk about uh, eBay's journey uh, in, in how they've migrated and evaluated the uh, GCP network and our abilities to protect uh, from application uh, attacks. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, Derek Chamuro. He's a security architect at eBay. And I'm also joined by Turi Bar Yoke, uh, the CTO and founder of Reblaze. Um, they'll be both talking about their solutions and, and how they've integrated with, with GCP. Um, so today what we're going to do is I'll go over and give a kind of a brief introduction about the Google network uh, and talk about its scale and, and the infrastructure that supports it. And then we'll dive into a little bit more about our uh, Cloud Armor solution, which is our DDoS protection service, uh, as well as a web application firewall. Um, we'll go over some you know, customer use cases and, and most typical use patterns. Uh, and after that, we'll hand it off to Tsuri to talk about Reblaze and how they've integrated with GCP. And after that, eBay, uh, Derek will come on stage uh, and talk about um, some uh, penetration and stress testing that they've done on the platform to evaluate uh, to migrating eBay workflows to GCP. And um, I hear they did so, got some good results. Um, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, and when, when we do, uh, we ask that you use the microphones here in the middle for questions. OK. So Cloud Armor is deployed actually at the edge of Google's global network. It's part of our load balancing infrastructure. Uh, before I begin, I, I do want to kind of give an overview of what our network looks like to, to give you an idea of the scale and scope. Uh, and it goes a long way in explaining and how we're able to do uh, the protections that we are able to do. Um, so we actually have uh, 19 regions or data centers uh, distributed globally. You can see here in blue. Uh, we also have a few future ones coming in, and those are the, the white dots. Um, in addition, we have another 134 edge pops or points of presence. Uh, these are co-located facilities within our ISP partners data centers. Uh, and what that means is we're able to receive client traffic and put them on the Google network uh, as close as possible to the clients. Right? So once, once uh, a request is made to a Google IP, it gets routed to the nearest edge pop, uh, and then it's on Google's backbone instead of being routed through the public internet. Uh, speaking of the backbone, we have 13 subsea cable investments that are either wholly or partially owned by us. Right? Those are all the, the blue lines that are being strung together. Um, on a daily basis, we move uh, the amount of data that we move across our backbone uh, is orders of magnitude larger than the, the data that traverses the public internet. Uh, what that means is uh, Google's network capacity is so large that we are actually able to effectively absorb and dissipate uh, most of the most common uh, distributed denial of service attacks um, without impacting any availability or reliability. So uh, most of our customers don't even know that they've been attacked. Um, like on other clouds, security is a shared model on GCP. Right? And when it comes to network security and security in general, uh, we work to secure our networks and infrastructure, and we provide all the tools and capabilities for customers to do the same in their environments. Um, in fact, we enable and encourage customers to follow a defense in depth approach, right? where you deploy uh, various security solutions at various stages of the stack that you can see here oh, kind of in the way. Um, and at every point in the stack, we also have room for partner solutions to, to deliver capabilities that may be more specialized uh, than we offer natively. Uh, today, we'll be talking about uh, Cloud Armor up at the top in, for application protection, as well as our global load balancing infrastructure. Um, but I will start off with kind of giving an overview of, of the network security controls that we have. All right? So we have three different types of network security controls that customers often deploy in unison. Uh, in red, we've got VPC firewalls. These are your traditional um, firewalls uh, using layer three, layer four semantics. Uh, you would use these to define the perimeter of a VPC, uh, north, south, as well as east, west. But you can even get as granular as per VM. Right? So you can use VPC firewalls to control uh, and define ACLs on a per VM basis if necessary. Um, they have an analog in blue called VPC service controls. 
VPC service controls allow you to define uh, effectively a virtual perimeter around GCP-based uh, services like managed APIs, things like um, Google Cloud Storage, BigTable, BigQuery. Uh, the point is you can use VP service controls to ensure that only authorized users, only from authorized locations, using only authorized machines can access or receive the data within those API-based services to mitigate things like uh, data exfiltration and really just make sure that only permitted functions are, are executing on uh, your resources. Uh, and finally, in green, we've got uh, Cloud Armor, which is instrumented and part of our global load balancing infrastructure. Uh, and that's able to filter and drop traffic coming from the public internet into GCP. So as, as I'll dive in a little deeper, we're able to do layer three through layer seven filtering. Uh, and I'll kind of explain how that works. Um, yeah. Um, before doing that, uh, it, you know, understanding how our global load balancing infrastructure works uh, is, is valuable, right? So the GCLB is not a DNS-based global load balancer. Uh, as many of you know, we actually publish an AnyCast VIP, uh, and this virtual IP is accessible from anywhere in the world. And when a client coming from California or New York or Singapore uh, goes and accesses that same IP, um, the edge pop location nearest to them will receive that traffic, right? And will then filter that traffic, will, will enter that traffic uh, onto the Google's network where it will be routed uh, to the nearest region wherever your applications may be deployed, right? So if you only have one, your application is only hosted in one region, that's where the traffic will go. But if you have your applications across different regions distributed globally, then, <laughs> uh, then we will um, route the traffic uh, where necessary. Um, so our load balancers are SSL terminating, right? And what that means is customers can do SSL offload. You upload your certificates into, into your global load balancer instance, uh, and then we can de we decrypt the traffic on the way in, um, and then we'll re-encrypt it on the way back out to your back ends. But in that small sliver of space where it is in plain text, that's where Cloud Armor is actually able to do the inspection uh, and evaluate and drop the traffic. Um, similarly, other points in the stack will filter out and drop, you know, bad traffic, however that's defined, you know, layer three, layer four attacks, um, uh, malformed packets and things like that will get scrubbed out at various stages of the stack, all of which happens way upstream of the, of the customer backends. So as I said, Cloud Armor is a part of our load balancing infrastructure. Uh, Together with the HTTP load balancer and Cloud Armor, customers are automatically protected from the most common types of uh, distributed denial of service attacks. Uh, things like SYN floods, ACK floods, DNS amplifications. These are the types of attacks that hit the news most common, most often. Um, these are the ones that have you know, terabit level bandwidth usage and things like that. Uh, and all that is protected and blocked automatically. Um, like I said earlier, most of our customers don't even know that they've been attacked. Uh, and we are working on, on exposing that visibility so in the future you, know, you will be able to you know, get a report and do sort of after action investigation uh, as necessary. Cloud Armor proper, um, as I said, we, we, we are in the sliver of space where the traffic is in plain text. So we can do um, full layer seven inspection. We don't look at the body. Um, but we do look at all the request headers and the cookies. Um, so you're actually able to define um, ACLs uh, today with IPs, right? We were generally available for uh, IP allow and deny. Uh, but in the future, uh, it, currently in an alpha, we've got geo-based access control, a full set of WAF capabilities, um, as well as a custom rules language to uh, allow you to define your own rules. Um, And all of this uh, should go without saying, but it's good to repeat it. All of this is built on top of infrastructure that we have designed and built for Google over the past 20 years to protect against uh, these common attacks to make sure that things like search and ads uh, and Gmail and YouTube all stay up and available, right? Um, so it's that same expertise that we've developed protecting our own applications uh, that allows us to go and, and enable customers to leverage that investment. Very big numbers there. 
So as I mentioned, uh, Cloud Armor is deployed at the edge of the network, and what that means is it's actually able to enforce the security policies upstream without consuming your own compute. Um, so Cloud Armor enables customers to protect applications from DDoS, right? Filter incoming requests uh, by geo as well as uh, most layer seven parameters. Um, and as a web application firewall, we're also going to ship pre-canned rules uh, to protect against the web's kind of most common uh, application attacks. So uh, we are porting over the mod security core rule set, if you're familiar with what that is. And we're starting with SQL injection cross-site scripting, but the plan is to port over and support the full uh, uh, core rule set. Um, and critically, we also have real-time telemetry for your own monitoring and security needs. I'll show what that looks like a little bit later, um, but the point is you've got logs going to Stackdriver, and you've also got a monitoring dashboard um, that, that helps you detect and react when, when there is something to do. Um, so as I mentioned, the Cloud Armor security policies are used to customize uh, access to protected resources. And it could be as flexible and as uniform or granular as you need. So although the protection happens at the very edge of the network, um, you can define the security policy, um, it, it define access controls that, that could be applied consistently to all of the applications in a single project. Uh, there's kind of a one-to-many relationship between policy and backend service. Uh, or if the business dictates, you can actually have customized controls where you would have a security, one security policy per backend service. And all that matters is you know, what, what you would allow or deny into that application. Um, once traffic comes into a, a backend service that's protected by a security policy, the rules within that policy are evaluated in priority order, right? Much like uh, most you know, application security appliances out there, uh, Although Cloud Armor is not an appliance, right? We we fall we fall down the list of rules in priority order. Um, each rule has a match condition, and if traffic matches that match condition, then the action associated with that rule will be taken. The action can be allow, deny. Uh, in the future, the action will be throttle if you need to do some rate limiting. Um, and if none of the traffic matches, if none of the rules hit, then the default action will be taken. And again, that could be allow, deny, or throttle in the future. Uh, and that, that provides the ability to, to create very flexible, very granular controls. Uh, one best practice recommendation, of course, is since we terminate evaluation after the first match, um, it's best to have all of your deny rules higher priority than your allow rules, right? So if you do need to drop traffic, that happens first. Uh, in terms of overall features and status, so I, I've mentioned this as I've talked before, but uh, we do have a rich and comprehensive feature set. Some of it is generally available today. We announced GA back at RSA last month um, for the granular policy framework, the overall distributed denial of service protection, the layer three, layer four stuff, um, as well as the ability to create IP um, lists to allow or deny traffic based on the IP in those policies, right? That's GA, as is all of our telemetry. Uh, currently in alpha, we have the rest of the WAF slate of features, right? That includes geo access controls, that includes our custom rules language, on top of which we've built um, the mod security rules, right? Uh, X SQL injection and cross-site scripting are up first. Uh, shortly thereafter, we'll follow with things like remote code execution, local file inclusion, and um, remote file inclusion. <laughs> uh, and then custom rules, right? So in addition to us shipping these pre-baked rules, uh, customers will be able to uh, use our rules language to select on any uh, layer three through layer seven attribute of the, um, of the traffic in order to, to filter out based on business needs. Um, so now going over some of the most typical use cases that we've got. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've got uh, DDoS protection, right? That's first and foremost. Um, you get that as soon as you deploy behind uh, the HTTP load balancer and Cloud Armor. Uh, the idea is we will filter out and scrub out any bad layer three, layer four traffic to the extent that you're only serving uh, HTTP or TCP traffic, and only good requests will get to you, right? So this is very common. Most customers um, love this and you know, you'll, you'll hear from uh, Reblaze and eBay talking about their, their thoughts on this. Uh, here's an example of our uh, real-time monitoring dashboard. All right, so we provide granular visibility um, both 
you know, at, a, at an overall level about your, your incoming traffic and you know, the percentages and the actual numbers of what's, what's allowed and, and what's blocked. But critically, we also have the ability to deploy rules in preview mode, right? So uh, this is akin to sort of passive rules in, 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 in older uh, WAF deployments. The idea is you would model the impact of the rule without it actually having, uh, without it having taking action on your production traffic, right? So we log uh, rules in preview mode. They log their action to Stackdriver, uh, but they don't actually stop the traffic. Uh, and then it's up to you to decide to take it off preview mode. So you're able to monitor the impact of previewed rules in these manage monitoring dashboards as well. You can visualize it. And most importantly, you can set up custom alerting policies. Right? If uh, using any of the metrics that are exposed in the monitoring dashboards, you would set up custom alerting policies uh, to trigger any of your um, incident response processes. Right? Notify the right people, and then you can go and take action. Um, uh, one of the most common use cases uh, is restricting uh, source IPs, right? Many of our customers have a business need to filter their, filter their traffic through an upstream proxy, right? And yet still want to have their projects in GCP and uh, the HTTP load balancer will expose a publicly available IP address. So what they'll do is they'll use Cloud Armor to define a default deny all rule, right? And then create two higher priority rules that would allow um, the source IPs of their upstream proxy Right, and perhaps their own corporate range of IPs. And the effect would be then that only traffic from the upstream proxy is allowed through the load balancer to the backend services. Uh, meanwhile, anyone else from the internet that hits the, uh, the public IP directly uh, would get denied. All right? That's only if you need to force traffic to come through an upstream proxy. Uh, and, and the final use case I wanted to talk about today uh, is, is the idea of downstream detection and upstream enforcement. Right, so the, the, the way that this generally works is customers will deploy some basic Cloud Armor security policies, right, and they'll have their applications within GCP as backend services. And they also have their own sort of custom monitoring um, custom monitoring solutions, right? They're, they're doing monitoring and analytics, looking at the application logs, but they're also bringing in data from a lot of other sources, like, uh, oh, there we go. Um, they're bringing in data from other sources, maybe the load balancer logs, maybe you know, anything else going to their own socks, uh, you know, any events going to their sims, things like that. On top of that, they'll have uh, threat or fraud detection, um, algorithms running or abuse detection, you know, and any number of things that they'll, they'll identify something that's bad based on, you know, things that are unique to their applications, taking, you know, all the context necessary. Uh, and then they'll define a signature and then push that signature as a Cloud Armor rule upstream, right? And the idea is once you've decided that some set of traffic is bad, you can go and enforce that upstream in Cloud Armor uh, and that you, you would have near real-time propagation, you know, measured in minutes. To, to, globally, um, to globally enforce these security policies. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it off to, to Tsuri, invite him back on stage, uh, to talk about uh, Reblaze and, and their integration with, uh, with GCP. Yeah, give a hand to Emil for the great intro uh, presentation about Cloud Armor. Um, so before I'm diving into my slides, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you both, uh, the team at Google and at eBay, for, the, these, for your trust, uh, uh, first of all, for your trust and for this great, amazing journey um, we did together uh, in the last several months. So Reblaze is a comprehensive security platform, or to be more precise, comprehensive application security platform um, deployed in the cloud. Uh, we are about to explore Reblaze, the comprehensive of the features of Reblaze, as well as our Reblaze integrated into GCP, leverages GCP products and platforms, Cloud Arm already mentioned, but also a few other products such as um, Cloud Security, Command Center, BigQuery, and Machine Learning. Reblaze is a cloud native solution that provides you with nearly everything you need to control and command your application. When we're looking at 
today's uh, threat maps, uh, threat, ma threat map, uh, we think it will be wise to divide, divide it into two, four different pillars. DDoS, well known, common on a daily basis. Bot management, which is basically a subset of DDoS, or uh, share some similarities with DDoS in terms of automated traffic, um, runs across a large network, but instead of flooding your network, flooding your resources uh, with incoming traffic, bot detection solution, uh, bot management solution will protect your uh, uh, platform from attacks such as account takeover, brute force login, even credit cards fraud, and simple scraping, data scraping. If your business is your data and vice versa, scraping is the issue you have to deal with literally every minute. The next is web application firewall. While DDoS and bot management focusing on traffic behaviors and patterns within the traffic, web application firewall focuses on the data, the actual data submitted over to the server. Does the data contain any malicious vectors, XSS, SQL injections, remote file inclusions, etc.? And last, but not least, especially nowadays, API security. And one might think, what makes API security a special case while it probably can be described as yet yeah, just another web application platform, which is simple HTTP requests, back and forth, reading data, and, and responding to the clients. However, today's API, or as they call it, modern APIs, is while originally were designed to enable computers, servers, communicate with each other, today's API, by design, serving humans, and bots and machines at the same time. If you have an API and you built your web application with Angular or React or any other framework, so your, your, the user interface, the interacting within the browser or within the mobile device, actually using API underneath, and the very same API will be used when you will release your mobile native application. And at the same time, your clients, your affiliates, will use the same set of API to communicate and to transfer data between their servers and yours. So with Reblaze, one of the, uh, uh, one of the key strengths of Reblaze is enabling you, and in most cases automatically, profile each and every case and assign the designated policy optimized for each case. So human a human access API will be enforcing and monitoring the human behavior along the line, while machines, B2B uh, uh, API, server-to-server -server API, will, have, will enjoy and will run under different, completely different uh, policy. Also, by definition, the fact that API is all about transmitting data back and forth, API is uh, at a, eventually each operation put some data, put some stream of bytes, either in a database or in the hard drive. And that suggests direct access to a database somehow, and therefore security became much more critical. And last, but from the service we take from our clients as well as from, you know, where analysts are actually reporting, the greatest challenge with API today is where are they? So it used to be a slash API or API subdomain to run your API, but today's within organizations, APIs are becoming available, publicly available on a daily basis, literally. Every cloud function you put out, every microservice you release or you consume and utilize, that's actually an APIs. So for the system administrator, for the security engineer within organization, there is no way they actually know 
and familiar with the location and purpose of each and every API because developers are simply releasing them on a daily basis. So um, let's talk about the setup of Reblaze and its relations, uh, relationship with Cloud Armor and other cloud security product. So in a typical GCP product, you will have, and um, Emil has actually covered some of it. So you will have a global CDN in front. The global CDN will be working in conjunction with a global load balancer, and in GCP, because in Cloud Armor, so CDN will be handling and deliver uh, content delivery in a most efficient way. Um, load balancer will handle everything related to SSL termination and, uh, and, and ensuring uh, high availability. And Cloud Armor is processing and handling the security. So you have those three products and platforms actually becoming your front shield and your front shield uh, uh, for your uh, front and for your for your global public front, uh, front end for, for your traffic. Now, Reblaze sides right next to it. So instead of a load balancer communicating with your uh, scale group, with your web front ends directly, your lo uh, the load balancer will communicate with Reblaze. This is where Reblaze um, enforces the DDoS, block all the bots, um, uh, operate with its web application firewall and provide the API security. Um, along with what Reblaze does in real time, protecting, blocking, dropping, or letting in, Reblaze pushes all the data to BigQuery. It's not real time, it's about 10 seconds, 10 to 12 seconds delay, but it's nearly real time. Now, this is where all the fun stuff are happening because BigQuery in Reblaze is being continuously analyzed, used to analyze the data. And every incoming request and every, every session being analyzed continuously. And as we detect um, attacks or misbehave from a user from a session, attacks of which you cannot block based upon a given request, rather you need some track record, you need to see a pattern. As we detect um, a so, uh, an attack source, Reblaze proxies immediately get updated, as well as Cloud Armor get updated immediately. So there's immediate action taking, uh, taking place as attacks, uh, is attack, attacks are detected. Um, the setup, the way we set it up, enables, uh, enable, enabled us to provide you, the users, with four features or some may call it principles, which we believe are key requirements in every security solution. The one is absolute visibility. That is a given. You cannot protect against something you're not seeing. In a web, a web scale, when you process millions or billions of, of, uh, of requests a day, you have to have the ability, the facility, the, the tools to analyze and get to each and every record and, and track each and every session. By Reblaze, we do more than uh, um, just uh, uh, data analysis in real time. The second principle is immediate action. As I mentioned, action taken in every request. Farther process or drop immediately. We, we detect the source of the attack, update immediately uh, proxies, update immediately cloud armor. Not only that, we also have um, we, um, integrated uh, with Google um, other uh, SIM products called um, Cloud Security Command Center. So also we push alerts and we push all the events to your command center so you can get in one screen, you get all the recent attacks. And if the event is taking place, you will, you'll be able to take action immediately straight from the portal. This, the third feature is recommendation. We help you, we help do the thinking for you. It's really hard to keep in mind all the areas, all the policies required, all the changes within your application. As I'll show you soon, Reblaze 
provides a recommendation where security policy might be better off, fine-tuned, restricted access, API discovery, as, we, as I explained. Nobody knows today where their API is. We blaze, given the capacity and the availability of BigQuery, every day we analyze the entire traffic and we spot areas in which we detected API activity and we say, okay, here's an API section within your application. It is not profiled yet as an API. Would you like to, in one click, set it as API so you will enjoy all the capabilities of API security? And last is our biometric behavioral analysis. So this is a capability which in a, in a recent month became the tool, the, the, uh, the tool that we actually fighting and detecting the most sophisticated bots. Um, and, and, and the biometric, I will just be explain you how it works. So in addition to the session graph that we hold and process in Rublis per user for each user, there is another graph which we maintain and that is the human interaction, the human presence along the session. So as applications are protected by Reblaze, every click and every keyboard tap, every, every click on a keyboard, every tapping, scrolling, every event that happens on the client side is monitored and reported to Reblaze and analyzed in BigQuery. So when we look at the data, when we look at when we inspect and analyze a session and each and every session get analyzed, not only that we have all the data and all the um, transactions performed by this uh, session, we also have, was there a human at all? Do we actually, are we dealing with a human or just emulated uh, a, a headless browser or any type of sophisticated um, bot attacks? And that wouldn't be possible without the BigQuery, because given we're processing billions, literally billions of billions of requests uh, a day, uh, BigQuery gives us the ability to add on top of it several other billions of mouse clicks and keyboards, and yet provide you as a user and our platforms, our systems, uh, uh, immediate analysis and immediate um, information about for each and every session. Um, when we talk about visibility, if I may take like a few more seconds to expand the visibility of Freeblaze. So um, in addition to the fact that every request, every header, every cookie, every authentication uh, 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 action, every API call is, is uh, record, uh, is stored in replays and analyzed in replays, we enrich every, uh, every request with um, metadata, which gives us a better profiling of each and every session. For instance, every request in replays is marked. Is it a human or headless browser or a bot? Is this session operating uh, within the Tor network or beyond proxy or beyond a VPN? Is it a server and a, or a VPS on a cloud somewhere, a data center? Or is it a domestic office uh, uh, link connection? And those profiles, and so absolute visibility means all this data is always available to make decision, to take action when needed. Um, another case which BigQuery, another case which BigQuery become uh, uh, critical for us is a bot detecting a brute force attacks, such as uh, logins or account takeover. For instance, w anybody recognize this? What this um, is? So, this is one of the uh, of the things we found while working with Derek and his team. It's basically, as, as you probably, if you know, with Gmail, your mailbox uh, on the left side to the at sign. You can spell it however you want, with any number of dots, at any position, it will always be the same inbox. So if you have a mechanism that says, validate your account by sending you an email, and you link on a, you go, you link on a click, uh, uh, you click on the link, and that's how you, your account is validated, 
What we have found in this case, in this particular case, and there's thousands of cases like this, we found 697 different variations of this email, as you saw. Now, those cases, we found them by mistake. We, we, have, we had no plan to go and seek for this particular attack. But given the machine learning and the analysis run on BigQuery continuously, the algorithm detected too much of a similarity between hundreds and hundreds of accounts and said, take a look at this. We spot something. Okay, so uh, Reblaze has more features than that, but time doesn't allow us to do so. And in this case, I will hand it over to Derek so he can share with us uh, his experience with Reblaze uh, and Cloud Armor. Thank you, Zuri. So uh, first, I want to thank our legal team for allowing me to talk about this, because in most cases, we're not allowed to. So some of you might be wondering why I'm up here. Uh, you know, given the nature of eBay, we kind of build our own servers, and we uh, you know, put them all around our global data centers. Uh, but like most of you, uh, I like to be prepared. As a security professional, too, I'm you know, extremely paranoid about whatever the next big attack is. And when I think about you know, some of our brands potentially going into an area that we don't own, and if we don't have a proper strategy in place, then that potentially is a threat vector for us. So uh, part of this use case was to determine how could we replicate our uh, existing known you know, perimeter security controls into an environment that, that essentially we don't own. So some of you might think of our, no eBay as being um, just eBay.com. You know, uh, and it's an online marketplace with over 175 million users, with over 1.1 billion live listings at any time. But I like to think of eBay as kind of like the roof of a house. Uh, and under that roof, we have many brands that fit our marketplace strategy. You know, whether it be StubHub, which is the world's largest online ticket marketplace, or some, a lot of our other global brands that help people around the world find what they're looking for in their local communities. So what do they all share in common? Well, we as a security team, we treat them all equally. And we want to ensure that we're protecting not only their brand image, but their reputation. So some of the goals that we had with this is that we wanted to first experiment with you know, how we could you know, extend this perimeter protection strategy no matter where our data could live. Uh, second, we wanted to kind of preserve the same level of visibility that we currently have within our on-premise systems. Ideally, we want to be able to correlate that data with our on-premise systems, with whatever we were able to achieve in an environment that we didn't, essentially we didn't own. And second, and third, we just wanted to see if we could break anything. I mean, that, the inert hacker in all of us, we want to see where we could induce some kind of failure, uh, whether it be within something we found within Google, or something we found within Reblaze, or something we found within the systems we provisioned. And on a side note, when we asked our customer engineer, uh, just said, hey, listen, we want to DDoS Google. I expected some kind of delay, and I was actually really surprised when he said, yeah, let's do it. So you know, it made me pretty happy about that. So a lot of you who have developed a DDoS uh, security program may be familiar with this. What this is is you know, part of the approach of having a successful defensive strategy to create tooling uh, for common DDoS threat vectors. Uh, so we put it across three pillars, anomaly detection, visibility and forensics, and attack mitigation. And in most cases, all of these work together to, uh, to mitigate attacks. So you might have a small attack that uh, sneaks under configured thresholds. So to mitigate that potential impact, you, know, the, uh, you, you would first look at some kind of anomaly detection alert. Uh, and with this alert, you would use your existing visibility and forensics tools to determine whether or not the attack was real, and then uh, look at for ways to be able to block the attack. And then you would use your attack mitigation tools to, uh, to implement some kind of filter or be able to filter that out. So with this in mind, we built a set of requirements that could mirror the existing tooling that we had on premise and do kind of like a feature parity comparison with the existing controls available through Google as well as through their trusted partners. So we decided to build a test site. Um, and while a test setup wasn't a replica of what our traditional sites would look like, we wanted to build a project that would represent all aspects of what we want to accomplish from this test. And we discussed actually building a mirror site, but what we realized is we would probably blow through our security budget for the entire year. So this is uh, an example of what we had. Uh, and first, we wanted to build something that was fully automated. Uh, if we encounter any failure, we want to just be able to destroy it and rebuild it as it is. So it kind of shows uh, a reflection of the attack traffic that we would expect in. So first, on the right-hand side, we, before we engaged with any other third parties, we decided to build some attack VMs and kind of create like this hairpin traffic that would come into the internet 
and it first hit the Google front end. So we automatically knew that we had uh, your, our L3 and L4 protection uh, that was managed by Google. So once it hit that layer, after that, it hit the specific test project where we parked a domain. Uh, we didn't want it to have anything to do with eBay. We just wanted it to be something separate. That way, you know, we didn't have any liability if anything ever happened to us. But what it was was it was a cloud DNS managed zone externally. We had a static IP assigned to the load balance fit and attach a less encrypt managed certificate with it that automatically rotated. And then it did our SSL offloading for us. So the next hop would then be the Reblaze proxy tier. So this Reblaze proxy tier was a managed instance group, which used an instance template of a managed uh, image through Reblaze. Uh, it was using uh, N1 standard uh, 16 instance types, which is 16 vCPUs and 60 gigs of RAM each. And it auto-scaled based off of demand. So in reality, for the test, we just kept two instances running at all times. And during the test, it would auto-scale based off of the specific metrics we had provisioned for it. Uh, and then we had uh, the BigQuery, uh, the logs go to BigQuery. So it was a structured data set uh, that was IAM controlled. We had access to them, nobody else did. And that was part of the reasons why we wanted to, to, to do this experiment. We wanted to uh, maintain some kind of control of the data that we were actually creating. From there, it would forward it to another cloud uh, DNS managed zone that was considered internal. Um, and then it uh, sent it to this specific tier of uh, VMs that we provisioned. These are uh, vulnerable uh, Docker instances that we uh, that we created. We uh, a lot of the they were susceptible to things like OS top ten attacks. The idea is that we wanted to keep them to the point where we could break them. So if anything uh, penetrated here, we wanted to see uh, monitor this this specific uh, tier and see if um, see if anything failed within the the upper part of the stack. So we partnered up with a third-party DDoS company specialized in, in kind of test driving what your security controls are, your DDoS mitigation solutions are, to simulate the true scale of a distributed attack. And we wanted to focus on specific DDoS types where considered common types uh, uh, from layer three to layer seven for our test cycle. So uh, the layer three, layer four attacks listed were more focused on megabits, megabits per second. Uh, as an example, like a UDP flood, which uses UDP datagram containing IP packets to flood random ports on a target network. Or um, while the layer seven attacks were more connection uh, focused, uh, per connection per second focused, like HTTP flood, which is an attack that uses a large number of HTTP get or post requests to target an application or web server. So the sequence of events was um, uh, the vendor initiated each attack individually. Uh, during each attack, we searched for impacts to availability through a series of scripted curl requests and web page uh, reloads, uh, and then monitored the performance on the VMs. And then following each attack, we cleared out any uh, dynamic IP blacklist uh, before the next attack start started. So uh, here are the results of the test as follows. So pass means good uh, in our case. So no visible impact to any of the backend service VMs. And a fail would mean there was visible impact to the backend service VM. So as expected, all layer three attacks were mitigated at the Google front end via Cloud Armor. Uh, any of the non-TCP traffic was discarded by Google's distributed firewall. Uh, and this left literally only the TCP connection floods and TCP flag attacks that could reach the uh, front end bit. Uh, so here are, are some of our findings. And this is kind of like the feedback. Mind you, when we did this test, we did this uh, late last year, uh, we worked really well with Google to say, hey, listen, this is some of what we found. And some of the product that you see today and that was actually released at uh, RSA is uh, from some of the feedback that we were able to give them to make the product you know, a lot more resilient. So at the time, uh, you know, all the attacks were uh, silently dropped. So we really didn't get any visibility into that. We didn't really have a, like the rich logs that we would want to see. Ideally, you want to be able to correlate that across all your properties. Uh, so uh, you weren't able to do things like short-term log analysis or uh, short-term th uh, threat analysis or long-term threat analysis. And that's kind of, kind of some of the feedback we gave. We wanted to see kind of some, some kind of summary logs so that we could be aware of any anomalous activity that was happening in Google. And at the same time, so we could start correlate that and trending that across all of our properties. So as you can see, all the layer seven attacks were mitigated within Reblaze, either through dy dynamic rule or bot challenges. And following each test, we needed to clear the dynamic IP blacklist uh, so that the next set of tests could successfully run. And from a visibility perspective, again, some of the things that we, we, we encountered is that some of the load balance logs were, were provided some rudimentary access logs and not a form that was easy to analyze. And uh, at the time, they only contained IP blacklist logging. Uh, from the Reblaze perspective, you know, all the, all the data was uh, through BigQuery. 
some of the can tableizations were difficult to pivot. We gave that feedback to Reblaze and they made them a lot better. And again, uh, since everything's logged to BigQuery, you can kind of build your own analysis tools if you want to for visibility. These are enabled defenses that we had. Uh, so the global ACL is a, a dynamic, uh, is a, is a network-based ACL. It does things like IP blocking, uh, ASM blocking, or via country. <laughs> the, the two that we primarily use are the global DRX uh, X-Deny, which is a dynamic IP blacklist, uh, and the deny bot. Um, deny anonymous proxies and deny tor are self-explanatory. Those lists are automatically updated for us. But um, a deny bot is interesting because a lot of vendors, what they normally do is just do, uh, their response is just injected JavaScript, but we found Reblaze to be a lot more intelligent where it takes a lot of uh, human detection components in order to be able to detect that it's actually a bot. So some of the techniques were envi uh, environment validation, proof of, proof of work, uh, human behavior interaction, which is literally like mouse clicks, moves and scrolls to validate the connection. Uh, and then we had a default eBay WAF policy, which is where we whitelisted HTTP methods, uh, get and post, and denying all others. That way we could allow certain arguments in while denying everything else. So uh, what you see here are the Reblaze traffic graphs. And uh, this is the graph of the scripted attack test before, after, and during uh, on the y-axis. Uh, you see uh, it represents the connections per second while the bottom shows the time range. And so this is a scripted <coughs> um, HTTP-based web flood. Uh, and so you can see that Reblaze starts uh, by challenging each request and asking the bot to re-request the same page. Since the bot never re-requests the same page, its request is not, uh, not passed through. And these bots get caught by the web page uh, dynamic rules and then are temporary blacklisted. And again, you can kind of see the trending from the bandwidth as well. So it starts sending challenges, the bandwidth increase, and as soon as the, uh, as soon as the bots are moved to the dynamic blacklist, the, the bandwidth drops. And as Emil uh, mentioned previously, these dynamic blacklists can be configured to auto-escalate to Cloud Armor. And again, uh, this is the simulated browser attack. And we had some connection strangers during the test. But as with the scripted attacks, you can see that the same thing went out. The challenges went out. Uh, and as soon as, as soon as challenging the response several times, the bots got moved into a dynamic blacklist. And again, the same with each, uh, with bandwidth, each, with each re-raised proxy. So the verdict for us, uh, it was a pass. Uh, Cloud Armor provides scaled out defenses against volumetric DDoS attacks, and Google's reputation precedes, uh, uh, precedes itself with mitigating these type of attacks. Um, there was a few different, uh, the, the blips that we found is that some, some of the telemetry, and, but given the feedback we were able to give, we see that in the product that is today. Uh, and again, with uh, Reblaze's bot detection and dynamic rules, uh, it was amazing at being able to stop a lot of the uh, layer seven attacks that, uh, that we encountered. At the same time, uh, the vis from the visibility perspective, we were actually able to get a lot of the telemetry that we wanted. So uh, overall, uh, Google Cloud Armor and Reblaze were a sound solution for DDoS attacks of all kinds. And uh, that's that. Also, we have, there's a survey on your app. So if you could, please take some time to give some feedback. And thank you.